we all enjoy a nice dinner or lunch at a restaurant of our choice these days. How would you feel if you were told by the management of your favorite restaurant now, or lunch counter, that we don't serve blacks here, and so you will have to leave? Would you stay and get thrown in jail, or would you just go someplace else? Today's presentation will highlight what happened to make it possible for you and me to sit down at a steak and shake to eat a burger and fry. In July 1958, the NAACP Youth Council sponsored sit-ins at the lunch counter of a Dockham drug store in downtown Wichita, Kansas. After three weeks of ill treatment and harassment by whites, the movement successfully got the store to change its policy of segregated seating, and soon afterward, all Dockham stores in Kansas were desegregated. This movement was quickly followed in the same year by a student sit-in at the Katz Drug Store in Oklahoma City, led by Clara Lupa. In spite of being arrested and harassed by whites, it was also successful. Black students from area colleges led a sit-in at a Woolworth store in Greensboro, North Carolina. On February 1st, 1960, four students, Ezel A. Blair, David Richmond, Joseph McNeil, and Franklin McCain from North Carolina Agriculture and Technical College, an all-black college, sat down at the segregated lunch counter to protest Woodward's policy of excluding African Americans from being served there. The four students purchased small items, then sat down at the lunch counter and asked to be served. After being denied service, they produced their receipts and asked why their money was good everywhere else in the store, but not at the lunch counter. Protesters had been encouraged to dress professionally, to sit quietly, and to occupy every other stool so that potential white sympathizers could join in. The Greensboro sit-in was quickly followed by other sit-ins in Richmond, Virginia, Nashville, Tennessee, and Atlanta, Georgia. The most effective of these was in Nashville, where hundreds of well-organized and highly disciplined college students conducted sit-ins in coordination with a boycott campaign. As students across the South began to sit in, all the lunch counters of local stores, police, and other officials sometimes used fists, nightsticks, and chokeholds to physically remove the demonstrators from the lunch facilities. White people would spit at and on students as they sat at the counters. Now, do you think you could take this today? If your answer is no, then you would find yourself in the nearest jail if you tried to fight back. The sit-in technique was not new. As far back as 1939, African-American attorney Samuel Wilbur Tucker organized a sit-in at the then segregated Alexandria, Virginia Library. In 1960, the technique succeeded in bringing national attention to the movement. On March 9, 1960, an Atlanta University Center group of students released an appeal for human rights as a full-page advertisement in newspapers, including the Atlanta Constitution, Atlanta Journal, and Atlanta Daily World, known as the Committee on the Appeal for Human Rights. The group initiated the Atlanta student movement and began to lead sit-ins starting on March 15, 1960. By the end of 1960, the process of sit-ins had spread to every southern and border state, and even facilities in Nevada, Illinois, and Ohio that discriminated against blacks. Demonstrators focused not only on lunch counters, but also on parks, beaches, libraries, theaters, museums, and other public facilities. In April 1960, activists who had led these sit-ins were invited by the SCLC activist Ella Baker to hold a conference at Shaw University, a historically black university in Raleigh, North Carolina. This conference led to the formation of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or the SNCC. 
SNCC took these tactics of nonviolent confrontation further and organized the Freedom Rise. As the Constitution protected interstate commerce, they decided to challenge segregation on interstate buses and in public bus facilities by putting interracial teams on them to travel from the north through the segregated south. So the next time you are in a restaurant enjoying a meal, or a movie theater watching Denzel, or riding the Metrolink, or in any public facility in this country, keep in mind that just 60 or so years ago, you were not able to do so. We must tell our children about this bit of recent history in the lives of black people so they too will understand that African-Americans were beaten, spat on, and arrested in order to change these things that made America treat us as full citizens. Many of us in this church at this moment remember when segregation was the law and how going out to dinner was a rare thing indeed.